We have done very extensive work on the heavenly judicial system. I may coin this phrase. We have uh, analyzed to the degree that it's possible at this point in time the dispensation of God's justice. Where the Bunisham judges the world and as a result of that the way God, what the Bunisham does to save the world, to redeem the world from its own consequences and we have made quite an exhaustive study as a result of all this why things happen to people and we've gone through this very heavily for quite a while, we have many takes on this now last week I deviated to some extent to study the internal mechanism of the way God operates in our world, what's called the operative mode of the British Arm. and there's no way I can go into it now with a very comprehensive shear but we've explained the notion of internal necessity and that the British Arm works through the internal design of reality itself and we have explored what that means for the Torah we have compared, run a comparative analysis on the halachas of the Torah and we have said that the halachas of the Torah are essentially phenomenal are phenomena, just like natural phenomena and that both correspond to certain realities and that the laws of Torah are not a legislative system or a moral system as such which everybody found the same but the Torah is a great ethical system this is really an incredibly superficial way to look at it the Torah really is a physics of the supernatural reality that's really what it is and because it describes the physics of supernatural reality we know what we should and should not do that's what it is when the Torah says you're not supposed to eat something which is not kosher the Torah is essentially saying that the way God constructs the world the way he constructed the Neshama the way he constructed the world of Kedusha and Tuma, a person who eats something which the Torah says not to is essentially doing damage to his neshama even though it may be invisible but at a certain metaphysical level on a supernatural level he is affecting the being of his neshama and that's what the Lord of Kash is all about that's really what it is the Torah Torah is advising us essentially what the essential regulations are of supernatural reality the Muchnistic reality and as a result of that the 630 commandments of the Tayyip Mitzvah follow those particular regulations that's really what it is we can no more free ourselves from the regulations of the Torah really and from its consequences we may not do what the Torah says but you can no more free yourself from the regulations of the Torah as you can from the things which have to deal with physical reality you see but as I said last week you can no more free yourself from the damaging consequences of eating for example trace eating something which is not kosher than you can from the damaging consequences of drinking gasoline the only difference is is that gasoline will kill you physically but will not harm you spiritually gasoline will not touch you in a shama interesting but something which is not kosher, like lobster, for example, will damage your neshama, but won't touch your body. So there are two different realms. And the essence of the thing is that we're dealing with two realities, and each reality has its own laws. And the Torah essentially describes to the reality which is invisible, but it's the reality of the spirit of the, of the soul. And, um, and, and you ask me, well, which one is the more critical reality? I ask you which one will last longer the reality of the body will only last so long the physical universe as we know it according to the Torah according to the Thomas will only last another 253 years and that's it it sounds like a strange number but the Thomas says I've mentioned this many times that from other Mauritian until the end until the end of the Messianic era will will be a maximum of 6,000 years that what the Vodachim said that Adam should do he essentially said that I will allow I will allot 6,000 years of human history to accomplish these objectives in which I set down it started with Adam if he failed to do it it will continue and it has to be done in 6,000 years 
at the end of 6,000 years, which is even at the end of the Messianic period, essentially what the Bonnet is saying is that the opportunity to create is no longer here. I no longer give man the opportunity to create the opportunity for free will. Whatever he did up to that point is what he will have for eternity. So, the law is there for physical reality as we know it, the way we know it today, will only be more operative for according to the Torah for another 253 years. It sounds like a really interesting number. Like none of us will be around at that point in time, generally. Maybe a couple of sessions here and there. <laughs> for those of us who really keep ourselves still and fit. <laughs> but, in a normal way, I don't really expect many of us to be around to really test out this hypothesis. It remains for another several generations to test out whether or not the world self destructs in the year 6000. You know? As far as we're concerned, we still have to accept it some faith. But, anyway, that's what it is. Well, I... This was last week's share. I went through quite extensively uh, about all these things. We went through very deep things about the nature of physical law, the nature of what's called theoretical explanation, the notion of different levels of explanation of phenomena. There's some interesting information that we went through last week, the notion of the cone, the nature of phenomena at different levels, and how the motion does what it does. And... <coughs> We will leave that topic. I'm not going to review that topic. It's a separate cheer in itself. Whoever is interested in getting a tape of that cheer should see our Gabba here. Well, it's a Gabba for the tape. We have other Gabba in a sophisticated outfit. <laughs> one with Mamuda on the tape, we should see him and he will be happy to arrange uh, something for you people. It was a very, it was a very, really very heavy shear. It was a powerful shear, and I would urge you, whoever can, whoever was not here last week, to really to get a taste. It's really well worthwhile. It's a very different shear. Okay, what is left for us to do? Really? I mean, after having finished all the things, where are we going from here? Well, we're going back to where we started from, really. And if you all remember, we started with the nations of the world. We started exploring a very important topic. And the topic really is, is extremely relevant to all of us. What is a Jew and what is a Goy? Why are there so many different Goyim of every shade, color, shape, and, 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 and nuance? Of, of every, there's so many different people. There are so many different types of nations. And it's, it's just an incredible variation. Why does the Bolshevik do this? Why are there people like the Chinese, and people like the Indian people, and, and people the Japanese, and you have the English, and, and you have the Africans, and the Australians, I, I mean, it's just an astounding thing. Why is there so much variation in, in mankind when everything started from one man? You see? And <coughs> the other question we ask ourselves, is the even bigger question, well, wait a minute, I mean, the whole purpose of life, the whole purpose of the world is the Torah. That's what we know. The Torah is the most important document ever given to mankind. It is revealed by the Buddha John Moshe, at Har Sinai, Mount Sinai. And obviously it is an incredible, important uh, thing. It, it, it is the physics of the supernatural realm. Well, if that's the case, why do we Jews are the only ones who have it? I mean, what is it, a Jewish sign? <coughs> is that what it is? Why are the Jews given the only really access to the laws from God's standpoint? I'm not talking about from our standpoint. Why would the Bodhisattva set aside a certain nation of mankind and give them the Torah and everyone else forget about it? Why would he do that? If the Torah is the central essence of all creation. <laughs> but if you want to ask a question or make a comment, please raise your hand. <laughs> it's alright, so please raise your hand. <laughs> we discussed the answer to these questions. We did. I don't remember, we did this about six weeks, two months ago, when we started the series, we went into a certain type of analysis of it. <coughs> and then I deviated to explore, to some degree, the inner processes of Mishpat, or justice. I am now returning to our subject. Okay? And... What I want to do now is go over rapidly some of the information we did two months ago so to bring everyone up to date 
and then, which means that I want to explain again the status of humanity at this point. Where going come from, where Jews come from. And what I want to do is answer a question in which we really started out with. What was the mechanism, what the Vodashim did in creating someone called Goyim? What was the mechanism that was used? What is the essential difference between a Jew and a Goy? And how was that difference achieved? It is. And with the concept of mishpat or justice that we have established, we can get a much better idea of what happened. Okay. It all started with one man, Adam Arishan. And as we've said, Adam Arishan before he sinned was a very unique individual. He was an individual where his soul was a super soul. It encompassed all the neshamas, all the souls that would ever live after that. It was all contained in one man called Adam Arishan. <coughs> that one man was given a task to observe a specific mitzvah. And by observing that mitzvah, he had the ability to transform all of physical reality, the entire world and his body, into a different realm. He had the ability to alter the nature of physical reality so that the supernatural reality would become manifest. And the physical reality would be purified and altered for good. In other words, right now, supernatural reality is behind physical reality. Your five senses pick up a physical universe, not a supernatural universe at all. There's no way that you can sense an angel, a mala, or another neshama. You cannot sense these things. But, in, there will come a time when you will easily sense this thing through your eyes. You will be able to see it. But in order for that to happen, <coughs> the supernatural order, the Ruchnistika world, must become the dominant stage of existence, and the physical world must be nullified, or in a certain sense, purified, it's called Zichor. That's what happens. The entire physical world itself <coughs> becomes purified, and the spiritual world becomes visible. Other reason had the ability to do that, and that world in which he would have established is called Olam Haba. That's it. That's the basic <coughs> idea of what happened at that point. Why did God ask other mission to do that? Because the Vodashem wanted to give other mission a state of great simcha and ecstasy that would last forever. But the Vodashem wanted to give this to other mission based on his own efforts, not as a free gift. Because it is the nature of a person who is similar to God in certain respects to want to be like God. And just like God is a creator, a giver, a producer, the person also wants to be responsible for his own eternity. He wants to produce it or create it on his own terms. So what the Vodashem did was essentially say, okay, I want you to do that. And he gave other mission, the first man, the opportunity to do that. He gave other mission the opportunity to create his own Olam Haba, to create his own eternal existence. What happened with Adam? Adam failed to do that. And because Adam failed to do that, we have what's called Adam mission after the sin. Now, is that the same person? No. Adam mission after the sin bore very little resemblance to what he was before the sin. Because after the sin, his Nisham was fragmented in such a way that no longer would there ever be an entity called a super Nishama or a super soul, and there would be many, many people. Now, instead of one person having the capacity to create the entire Olam Haba and its complete structure by himself, he now would have to share that process with many other people. This is what would happen. And he was only one person now among many. So the process of creating Olam Haba now became a collective task because mankind was now a collective entity. Man was no longer a single being wrapped up into one person. It was now a collective entity composed of many people. Hence, the task of creating Olam Haba was now assigned to many people. Each person would have a specific <laughs> aspect of construction. And the totality of humanity that emerged from modern mission after the sin would be responsible collectively for constructing the entire realm called Olam Haba. What happened after other mission? Well, after other mission, when we look at the history, we see the generation of the flood, the Dora Mabal, and we see many wicked men, and we see an entire generation that refused to do the will of God, refused to submit their understanding and their, in a sense, their arrogance 
to the real forces of reality. And God destroyed them all and allowed one man to survive with his children and his family, Noah, with a, a representation of each of the uh, being of the animal kingdom, you see. And after Noah comes back in the world, he again begins the task of constructing a humanity. Because Noah was very similar to Adam in the sense that he was the progenitor of mankind. All mankind that came from other missions was destroyed except for Noah. And from Noah was like a second Adam. Because mankind as we know it today all evolved to Noah. Really. Now, there were ten generations from Adam to Noah and there were ten generations from Noah to Avram. What was very unique about Avram was the following was that in his time the nations of the world decided to war against God and they decided <coughs> in their own crafty way to construct a tower called the Tower of Babel. Now, and what the way the Torah relates it, which is only essentially somewhat metaphorically, is that they expected to build this tower and go up on this tower and war with God. Now these people weren't stupid and they had no intention of actually war with God on the basis of height. But obviously that tower represents some kind of Kishu's entity, some kind of Avodazor, the construction and inner mechanism which is absolutely unknown to us, it is lost to us, what they could achieve or accomplish by doing this. But they felt that somehow by mankind getting together as a unit and pulling down or unifying and integrating every force, every cosmic force related to Tumor, to the Kishu, they can in some way usurp the world from God. They can use the laws of a, a negative spiritual reality to somehow dominate their world. The actual mechanisms of this are unknown. We do not know how they do that, how they attempted to do that. But there's no question that whatever <laughs> mechanism they were doing was real and quite effective. You see, what did the British do? He did not destroy them like he destroyed the Doha Mabo, the generation of the flood. What he simply did was to confuse their tongue. And from that point, all the languages of mankind emanated. So that none of them can communicate with each other. And the beginnings of different nations materialized. But God decided at that point, because of the fact that these, these people were so rebellious against him, that he would further reduce their ability to relate to Adam, to Oram Haba. Now this is a critical point. Adam Rishon related to the task of building an eternal life. He had the Kedusha in his Neshama to transform the physical reality and create a spiritual world. He had that Kedusha. Adam Rishon did not lose that ability. Rather, that ability was simply differentiated and passed out to many different people. But there was never a confiscation of that ability. And that's what's very important to understand. The ability to construct a eternal supernatural realm through the powers of Neshama, through the powers of Kedusha that comes from Mithras, was never confiscated from Adam. It was simply given over to many people. It was shared, you see, because the Neshama was fragmented so that many of them now had that power. But they all had that power only in a fractional way. Each one had a certain particular fraction of it. Those people, those people, <coughs> continue to rebel against God and what the British did for the first time was reduce their ability to construct Olam Haba. He did not confiscate it but rather he reduced it so that most of the people who lived in the world at the time 20 generations after Adam in the generation of the Tower of Baba, which is the same time that Avon lived lost a great deal of the ability to construct most of Olam Haba. And most of that ability was given to one man who was seen as an individual who could construct Olam Haba because he was a tzaddik. He was a man who was interested, he was a man who was, who was essentially dedicated to the task of which other Mauritian was once given. And that of course is Avraham Avino. He was the only man seen fit in his time <coughs> who would have the ability to attain this particular task.
what happened was that there was an enormous shift, a shift of ratio in terms of the construction of Olam Abba. Whereas before Abba, before the Darth Raga, all of mankind equally shared in the ability to create Olam Abba, even though it was collective, after Avom, they no longer shared that. After Avom, Avom himself now had the ability to construct most of Olam Haba. I don't know the exact percentages, but let's say for the time being that they had the ability, Avom was given the ability to construct, let's say, 90%. So that the 10% left of Olam Haba was given to the rest of the world. They were, what was confiscated then wasn't the ability to create an Olam Haba. What was confiscated was the amount of Olam Haba they could construct. Now, this is a very critical thing, so Avom suddenly became an individual who had the power of all mankind within himself alone. And what the Bodhisattva said is, you and your children will retain that power, you see, and I will diminish that power to the rest of mankind. <coughs> what is very important to understand, what is very important to understand is the following concept. And what is that? Is that the men of this time were called Shoshim or Ruth. And I have mentioned this before, that the people who lived until the time of Avram, or actually until the time of his two sons, Yitzhak and Yaakov, were called Shoshim. All of those people had the ability that whenever they did good or bad deeds, those deeds would inscribe or engrave the capacity of their Neshama to do good or to do evil. It would live in predetermined disposition, a predisposition towards good or bad deeds. In other words, in the time of Noah, for example, or rather, in the time of Avram, you had many, many people living in the world. But these people, even though they may have appeared to look like us, they were very different in terms of internal spirituality. They were enormously powerful, much more, more powerful than we are. Thousands of times greater than we are in terms of what we are today. And what it was is that each one of those individuals at that time, or rather, groups of those individuals, had the power to create a species of mankind. And this is what they did. Each one, because they were Shrosham, they were roots, they had the power to create a Neshama that would evolve from their Neshamas. And that Neshama would become the Neshama, the, what's called the root Neshama of all their children. So that an individual in the time of Avram, who was a very great Tzaddik, would fashion within himself the type of Neshama which when then passes down or in some way influences the Neshamas of his children or of his generation, already has the predisposition to be a Tzaddik at birth. That's what's critical. <coughs> the deeds of the men who lived at that time could create those predispositions so that the generations which ensued would be inclined to follow on that path. Not entirely, they still had free will, but not as great, which means that a Shurish had much more free will than an Onof or a branch. You see, much more free will. Because somebody who was born from Avram would automatically have a much greater desire to be a Sadiq just by the fact that he was Avram's son. So, obviously his free will already was to some degree curtailed. The same thing if a Russia at the time of that, uh, at those times, would create an Ashama where the generations which would ensue with him, from him would have the, pre, pre, uh, the, uh, the predisposition or the proclivity, the inclination to become a Russia. But they would still have the to undo some of that. There's no question about that. But they would already share in what their Shurish created. <coughs> and this is very important. We have gone through this quite at length that these original generations were called Shroshim because they were root souls in the sense that their souls again determined is from a predisposition standpoint what the essential directions would be for their children. <coughs> now why God did this? Why God structured the world of souls so that at the outset there would be what's called root souls and there would be consequent grand souls if we may use the term is a very, very difficult thing to answer. In order to understand that, we'd have to completely stop what we're saying here and go into the entire concept of the structure of soul as such and where they come from and what they are and why they're structured that way. These are enormously deep topics. But the Gunnishom structured in the face so that when he split up the Nisham of Adam Rishon, it was divided into root souls and grand souls. Shoroshim and Anafim. Now, the last statement. By the time Avon was born, the Bonishan looked down and he looked at all these Shroshim, all these root souls. And he said, well, what's going on over here? What have all these people done? To what degree, what kind of predispositions do we see on the face of the earth? 
And what the Punisher saw was an astonishing thing. He saw that only one man continued the original purpose of other mission, the original purpose of other mission, you see, and therefore he predisposed all his, all the shamans that would be generated from him <coughs> to become people who would have great spiritual powers, you see. And then we looked at all the other shamans, all the other shorsham, he saw that they created people who essentially would be inclined to do wishes and would have no desire at all to have anything to do with all of my blah. That's an astounding thing. When they further examined the matter, you see, more minutely, he was able to punish him, was able to, with the attribute of justice, or through the attribute of justice, to literally itemize, or enumerate rather, the number of categories or levels. So, we have the magic number at that time, where the Bonacham determined that there were 70 different categories of neshamas that were created in all the other people of the world. And there was one neshama avon in contrast to those 70. Which means that the Bonacham saw, through the attribute of justice, 71 classifications of root souls. He saw 71 species of spiritual man. Not physical man, spiritual man. There are 71, or there were at that time, 71 <coughs> different types of neshamas. Different types of men with 71 different levels or sensitivities to Ruchnius or Kedusha. Each one having a totally different sensitivity to another. So therefore, even though physically they were regarded as one species, the man, the species of men, spiritually they were regarded as 71 different species. And one level was about as as similar to another as the primary itself, for example, to the uh, to the uh, to the reptile. It sounds strange, but that was the, that that was the thing. If we go up, if we say if we say that well, okay, if we say number seventy was the best of the of the bad lot, and number one was the worst of the bad lot, would Avon be number seventy one? If we if we take that table in this way, where Avon was number seventy one. And he was the only one who created a root soul that was, had anything to do with Olam Avar, and the rest of them, from 70, 69, all the way down to uh, 1, 3, 2, 1, and we say that 70 was the best, going down with number 1 is the worst, the absolute worst, you see. We see 71 different species, 71 total different capacities to deal with spiritual aspects, and this is what it was. You see. And that's what the bullets in the turn at that point in time. Quickly. Now there was one more important phase, and that was the following, is that by Martin Turah, the Bodhisham essentially he looked at the world again and reevaluated the entire creation, and he saw again, with respect to the objective of Olam Haba, who was ready to create an Olam Haba. And he basically saw that only the generations of Avom had that capacity to create an Olam Haba. All the other people, the other seven categories, didn't have that capacity anymore. So what the Bonisham finally did, and I, I went into this, that he went around to all the nations of the world in a spiritual level, you see. All the nations of the world, and he said to them, I give you one more opportunity to continue to be a part of the objective of other Mauritian. I give you one more opportunity, and if you will accept the Torah, and you will accept this level of spirituality, you will be able to do that. What they did was they turned it down. And what happened, what the Bonisham did was create a new type of entity that never existed before. And that entity is called the Goy, or the non-Jew. Why did it never exist before? Because what the Bonisham did was the following. Up from the time of Adam to the time of the giving of Torah and Sinai, all men at that time had the ability in their neshama, in their spiritual neshama, in their kohas of ruchnis, in their spiritual powers, to create an olam haba. They all had the ability, by doing mitzvahs, to transform physical reality. They all had that power. Never had there been a man created who lacked that power. In fact, to create a man who lacked that power is like creating, I mean, it's, it's a total absurdity. It is a complete absurdity as far as a man is concerned. Because man has no other purpose but transforming physical reality into an eternal world. Man has no other pur- purpose but to become eternal. There is no other purpose for a, for a man. God created men to give them eternal life. To create a man who doesn't have the ability to go to eternal life is a total absurdity as far as God is concerned. Yet, what the Bonisham did was, 
So the first time what the, he did was create a kind of individual who was exactly of that particular uh, nature. He divided mankind, something he never did before. And he took a great section of mankind, rather all those who were root of the, the, the branches of the 70 nations who were not able to relate to Allah Bar, and he confiscated forever as nations the ability to create an Allah Bar. He confiscated it. Now what does that mean he confiscated it? What it means was then the Shamas were not the same. Just like other nations before the sin and other after the sin were two individuals because his soul after and before and after were totally different. His whole sense of consciousness was entirely different. The consciousness of an individual before the revelation and after the revelation was different. You see, that there were created many, many people who no longer had any vestige, any particular ability to create an Olam Haba at all. And only the Jews retained that ability. This is what a Goy is, and this is the definition of a Jew and a Goy. A Jew is an individual who has a certain type of soul. which has the capacity through various means, specifically through performance of mitzvahs, to transform levels of reality from one to another. He can shift reality from physical to supernatural mode. He has that power. In that sense, he's like a creator. A goy, a non-Jew, is an individual who has an ashama with which, who doesn't, which does not have that capacity at all. He's lost it. And that kind of individual first emerged at the Torah, at Matan Torah. So, when someone asks you, was Adam Jewish or was Noah Jewish? The answer is, yes, really. Because what is a Jew? A Jew is essentially someone who has the capacity to create an Olam Haba. And in that sense, they were all Jewish. Before Martin Torah, everybody was Jewish. Everyone. It was one big Jewish world. Really. It was after Martin Torah that some, some, something called a Jewish nation was created. You see. We think that at the giving of the law of Sinai at Martin Torah, the Jew was created, you see. And that Avon was before, or these people before were not really Jewish. Noah was really Jewish, you see. So suddenly the identity or the entity of a Jew was created at that point in time. That's not so. No, that's a total mistake. Everybody was Jewish before them. After Mount Torah, only a select few people of mankind became Jewish, and the rest of them became non-Jewish. That's really what happened. Now, what happened to all these people? What happened to all these people called Goyim, who no longer had the ability to construct an Olam Well, since they no longer had the ability to construct an Olam Haba, they have to do with the Torah. God never gave him the Torah. Why? Because if you have nothing to do with supernatural reality, if you have nothing to do with altering the nature of reality, what do you have to do with the Torah? What do I have to give you a book on the physics of supernatural events? If you have nothing to do with that realm, God would have no interest to tell you anything about a realm or about a level of reality in which you have no interface. That's why most of mankind has nothing to do with the Torah. That's why even though the Torah is the most central instrument ever made, and it's the most critical textbook ever written, most of mankind doesn't know it. Because just like God does not reveal to most of mankind the laws of what? Of how to control angels. How many people know that? How many people know how to use Shemus? To manipulate all the angels, all the entire angelic realm, to literally turn the world upside down. How many people know that? Well, why doesn't God reveal a book about that? Because it's none of your business. Meaning, there is no absolutely no purpose in it, other than curiosity, or power, or whatever you want. You see? That's what it is. So as far as the Goyim are concerned, they have no need for Torah. They were excluded from the instrumentation of Torah, from the potential power which is in Torah, they were excluded. That's what Goyim about. Hence, from then on, human history, as far as the Gentiles are concerned, has nothing to do with Torah. Now, 
if it has nothing to do with Torah, what about the Jews? Well, they have to do with Torah. Why? Because they can do something. When a Jew does a chet, you don't realize this. <laughs> when you do a chet, when you do a sin, you have more power to do damage. You can do greater damage to reality, I mean, spiritual reality, than when a guy sits and destroys cities. If you take a full city where there's no people, and you destroy the entire city with a nuclear weapon. You literally pulverize the complete city, you see. There's enormous damage. The damage of that is minuscule against the damage that you can do when you're not Shema Shabbat. Because you don't realize, and this is the thing, the incredible grandiosity about our world, our physical universe, is its magnitude. When we want to know what is greatness in the physical realm, what is greatness in the physical realm? Greatness in the physical realm is one of dimensions. It's one of spatial or temporal dimensions. Time and space. That's greatness. Greatness is energy, matter and energy. The sun, the power, the energy of a sun or a star is an incredible thing. Unbelievable. 50 million degrees on the surface of the interior inside the sun. That's an incredible figure. 100 billion suns in the Milky Way galaxy. 100 billion galaxies. Mm. Unbelievable sizes. Incredible numbers. These are all exponential numbers. Big exponents to them. The number of atoms in the world. The lifespan of a meson to the minus some billions of a second. These are incredible numbers. But these are great things that have to do with time and space. You see. The little man, <coughs> the little person, the Jew who sits on his chair and sits and learns Torah looks like an absolute non-entity when he's compared to the universe, doesn't he? When you're flying in a plane, you look down, you can't see any people. You can't even see them, they're like roaches. You, can, you can't see them, they're like insects. You see? You can't see these people. What kind of power can this minuscule non-entity have? The answer is, that person sitting and learning has the power not of size or dimension, he has the power of existence. Because greatness in the spiritual realm has nothing to do with size. It has to do with what's called existential power. How real are you? The existence that you have, how long will it last? You see? And that's a property of the existential quality. You see? Because it's strange. We don't know this. We don't understand this, you see. Because you think that everything exists on the same way. And in our world, everything does exist. Everything which exists in the physical world exists in the same way. It only differs in physical dimensions in some way. But in the spiritual world, variation has nothing to do with these things. What variations are seen is in existence itself. As I've said to you, that in the world of spiritual worlds where you have different levels of spirituality, a malach, on a higher spiritual realm, or rather a malach on a lower spiritual realm, cannot know a malach on a higher spiritual realm. If you have several different realms, and a malach lives on this one, and a malach exists on that, you say, well, what is this malach on that one? What is it? He lives on the first story, and he lives on the second story? Only in the physical world, because in the physical world we're confined to space. So variation is seen in size. But in the spiritual realm, this Malach cannot sense that Malach at all. There's no ability to be aware of him. The upper one can sense the lower one. Can you see a Malach? A Malach is a real entity. It is a consciousness standing in front of you with real ability to do things. He can be standing right in front of you. You will have no knowledge of it. Why not? Because he exists in a different way. You see, he's not bigger than you in size. He's not more powerful than you in energy. His existence is different than you. And that's all the difference. Dealing lies his greatness. And that's the greatness of the spiritual realm. That's why the Jew who was given the Torah, God says to him, you don't understand, you don't understand. Don't want to have the size, don't want to have the quantity. It's quality, it's the way you exist that counts. Because whether you know it or not, I have connected you, I have tied you to all spiritual realms. And even though I've put you at your lowest foot in the physical realm, don't think for one minute that you're a physical being. It is true you can't do much about the sun. 
to see. So you think that you're a powerless being. You think you're a powerless being with respect to the sun. So that's an incredible mistake, you see. You have the ability to create and destroy literally levels and levels of existence. You have that capacity. No one has the capacity to annihilate the sun. But you have the capacity to annihilate beings and entities which are infinitely more powerful than the sun in what they really can do. You have the ability to manipulate forces which cause the sun to shine in the first place. Which is the greater power? That's the real power. But that's the power only of a certain type of soul. And that's the soul of a Jew. That's what is confiscated from those who refuse to participate in spiritual realities. They no longer can interface in that kind of thing. That's why they no longer have the Torah. To be involved in the Torah means to have a certain kind of neshama. It, has the, it means to have the ability to do certain things. Existentially. Now, if the Jew has that ability, and the Goy no longer has that ability, that's why all of Goyish, all of history, as far as the Goyim are concerned, has nothing to do with Torah, then what is the purpose of Goyish history? Then what is it all about? You see, if Goyim lost the ability to create an eternal life collectively as a nation, they do have the ability to acquire an eternal life as individuals. They can, two ways, by converting and becoming Jewish, and altering the metaphysics of their soul, or by doing the seven mitzvahs that they were commandments in an exemplary fashion. So they have the ability not to create Olam Haba, but once Olam Haba is created, they have the ability to exist in it eternally, but they cannot construct it. They are residents. They have the ability to reside, but not to own or create. Only the Nisham of a Jew can own or create. Well, to say, a guy can only rent. I mean, it sounds funny. It sounds strange. Because the Jew is always trying to own everything. I mean, it's this thing, you know? There's a certain concomitance there, but anyway. But that's essentially what it is. But that's, that's really what it's that. Now, I just want to say one point. There's no discrimination here. Well, that's, some people might be thinking that. But we are not dealing with discrimination. God does not discriminate in His creation. God loves, created and loves all mankind equally. There is no difference between one man and another as far as God is concerned. But at the same time, the Bonisham gave the power to men to choose and create. And that power is what differentiates one from the other. It is the power of their own creative ability, which destroys or, or what? Or creates eternity for them. So God must judge them. So the one thing that does discriminate is performance. Just like if you do something wrong, you will go to jail. You see, it's called discrimination. No, there is no discrimination for criminals. Because when it comes to performance or function, you are responsible for your actions. So when God changed or shifted the internal nature of mankind, He shifted men, He varied men, you see, with respect to the way they behaved. There is no discrimination here. The is not interested in color, or whatever have you, or, or ethnic origin. It's absurd. God is the one who made all this. <coughs> the question is, if the Bonisham did differentiate mankind into two segments. And the sec- segment, the Gentile segment, the Goetia segment, has no ability to go to Omar Bar collectively, so then why do they continue? Well, they continue on in history for two reasons. One, because it is possible for Goetia to still get out of my bar, and that alone would demand the fact that they would continue to exist. And, more than that, God still rewarded the Goetia. Another thing. He said, okay, you don't want to create a Lama Bar, you don't want to turn existence, okay. But if you act civilized, if you do the seven mitzvahs, if you behave in a way which is essentially civilized and correct, if you are ethical in your own behavior and you are mentioned, then I will give you the reward. But the reward will be this life, the physical life. God essentially gave the Goyim this world as the reward. That's why the guy who enjoys himself in this world, you see, is not really to be looked down on. That is exactly what God wants. That is his reward. But that is not what God wants the Jew to do. Although God wants the Jew to have a good life, you see. 
the Buddha does not want a Jew to preoccupy himself with physical pleasures and with what goes on here. Why? Because that's not his interface. His interface is with the spiritual world. Through the Torah, you see. The Buddha does not want the Jew to become involved with a segment of mankind which essentially is in a confiscated status. God doesn't want you to preoccupy with something which was on the contrary taken away. <coughs> That's absurd. So the purpose of a goy essentially is to be a mensch, to keep the seven mysteries which were given to him, and enjoy the fruits of what? Of Olam Hazem. The purpose of a Jew is to work to be over in spiritual matters and interface and create an Olam Chapa. This is the essential difference. That's an interesting question. If a person has talents, if a person has talents in the physical world, should he use those talents? Well, the point is like this. If a person has great artistic talents, or if he has whatever it is, if he has great artistic talents, musical talents, or secular talents, should, should he waste those talents? You were put here to do something with your, with your neshama. That's it. And what you do with your neshama is what determines the status, the existential status of that neshama for all time. The peculiar, the peculiar talent that you may possess while you live now should be in some way used to enhance your relationship with God. But if you begin to see these talents as an end in themselves, to what? To achieve wealth, or fame, or power, okay, or even to, in, yeah, if you use those talents to achieve Kiddush Hashem, then you will be using those talents in what? With respect to your neshama. That's fine. That's fine. But you see, you can't get carried away. See, if you'll notice, why is it that the Jewish people have never been involved in the arts, really, or music? In many of the aspects, it is true. If you look at Jewish history, you will see that in general, yes, Jews in general have been very not involved in the things that preoccupy the Goyim. Drama, theater, okay. the arts, or whatever have you. Even secular subjects, up to a certain point in time, only recently do you really see this. If you look at the all Jewish history, you will see the, they, the Jewish people have also called people the book. And the book that we're talking about is the Torah. Why? Because the Jewish people have always recognized that this is a critical document, this is a critical instrument. This is what allows the interface to spiritual reality. Everything, basically, in what you do, in some way, must be seen vis-a-vis -vis the instrument of Torah. If you begin, yes, if you begin to use the talents in and of themselves because you enjoy it, just because you enjoy it, or because it can lead to certain creativity, no. in a certain sense, it is considered waste. What, it is. What, if you said, what I said is that if you use your talents for the sake of Kiddush Hashem, if you use your talents in whatever way you can in order to enhance your relationship with God, this is praiseworthy. Oh, okay. I said that. It is praiseworthy. You see. The Ramchal Rabbi Chaim Sada goes even so far to say is that what is it that you can really learn? You know, there's a huge amount of books out there. There's an enormous amount of Chochmah. And what the Ramchal did, the Rabbi Shalom Sarah did, he wrote a small essay on what it means to be a Tamil Chacham. The definition of a Tamil Chacham, operation in terms of what he has to know. And the Ramchal, who was a very great uh, and very erudite man, who knew many subjects, said, what well, are you supposed to learn? What are you supposed to learn? There are so many subjects out there. So the Ramchal says very basically, what you must know, he says, the first and foremost wisdom in which a Jew must obtain without exception, is the knowledge of God's providence and God's world. That is the first thing. Why you're here, where you are going, and how to get there. If you don't have the answer to these questions, if you haven't occupied yourself with understanding that, and you die before you have answered that, you will have wasted to a large degree your life. And that's it. Because a person was not put on the physical world in order to enjoy the physical life, or even to study the sciences or the heart of the physical world. The truth of the matter is, is that from what Lusado saying, what Moishkan Lusado is saying, is that it is even constant a waste to sit and learn mathematics on a totally advanced level. If you learn mathematics, for example, because you need to make a panosa, because you have to, in some way, make a living, 
and you choose a certain type of discipline and you occupy that, that, that discipline, that is permissible. If you learn mathematics because you want to understand some of the ways God created the world, the beauty of the physical world, that is permissible to a certain degree. Why? Because what the Bonishim wants you to do is to go directly to the source of what his information is. He wants you to learn what the world is about in terms of his textbook. The magnum opus of the Bonishim is the Torah. The Bonishim could have written any book. The Bonishim could have written a book on physics. Could you imagine what kind of book that would have looked like? <laughs> could you imagine if the Bonishim wrote a book on biochemistry? It would have been incredible. <laughs> right? But for some reason the Bonishim says, I can write any book I want. Why? Because who knows reality better than me? Since I made it. I designed it. So I can write a manual describing how I designed reality. And I can write a manual on every phase of reality. But the Bonishim says, the only manual that I feel like giving to men is the manual of what I did with spiritual reality, supernatural reality, and its interface to physical reality. Why? Because I am concerned with eternity. I didn't make men for the transient existence of a physical world. You see yourself, look at the physical world. It's here today, gone tomorrow. Everything changes. What was once young now becomes old. What was once healthy now becomes sick. It's a constant change. There is no such thing as a permanent status in the physical world. So the Buddhism says, I don't want you to preoccupy yourself with that which will not stay, with that which will not endure. I want you to occupy yourself with the regulations of a reality which will endure. And that is the Torah. So the Buddhism says, I appreciate the fact that you have a tremendous desire to know all wisdom, but if you're only a person, you must limit your time and your ability to the wisdom that I teach you is the greatest of all wisdom. Because that's the textbook that I wrote. Let me go on. Let me go on. Let me go on. What I want to know at this point is to have a better understanding of the mechanism that's being employed to generate these particular human consequences. That's what I want to understand. We have said that essentially, as far as the attribute of justice is concerned and the attribute of mercy, that the attribute of justice is an attribute which existentializes. What does that mean? It means that since a person is placed on this world here to do certain type of deeds, and since the deeds that you do can determine whether or not you exist eternally or not, the deeds that you do have a way of shaping your existence. They won't make you grow in size. They won't make you stronger physically. But they have a way of imprinting on your neshama an existential status, which can either qualify as eternity or not. Your deeds have the power of existentialization. Do we understand that? At the same... No, at the, okay. It means that your deeds have the ability to create an existence that will go on forever. That's called to existentialize. It gives existence. If you do a mitzvah, you give yourself existence forever. You existentialize. If you do a sin or hate, you have the ability to de-existentialize or annihilate. You have the capacity to destroy eternal existence and wipe yourself out. That's what it is. That's the ability. That ability was given to you because God made you like Him. He made you into a a little God and he said I will give you the ability to create whether you will be here forever or not I won't give you the ability to create the world or the story that's out of your hands but I will give you the ability to determine whether or not you will be here forever or not which means that I will give you the ability to create your existence as a God and your ability is, comes from free will you can choose you can do it you can choose to do it without any pressure coming from anywhere. Your will is free, transcends all existence. It is free like my will is free. So your will is free. And you can do that. You can make yourself live forever. Or you can destroy yourself. That is the power of free will. That is the power of what's called din, or justice. And what God does is He examines you on the basis of that. Now, that is a very severe consequence because if a person does chatoyim, he will annihilate himself. So we have said that what the Bonishim does to reconcile that or to redeem the person, to save him 
from destroying himself is that the Bunashem existentializes the damage. Meaning that if a person doesn't sin, rather than letting that, letting that sin be a statement of what he's going to be or how long he's going to exist, what the Bunashem does is extract the damage and give it its own life. He extracts the damage from the fabric of the Neshama and takes it out. So the neshama can survive. But what happens to the damage? The damage is then slapped back onto the neshama as an external parasite, which then simply eats into him and causes him pain. But it does not destroy him. That was the concept of externalization. If God didn't do that, then the evil that men did would reside in the neshamas and would force annihilation. It would force themselves to be destroyed. Because that's the nature of his creative power. He can either create or destroy himself. <coughs> For God to, in, what God did was to prevent mankind from destroying himself. He interfered with the creative process that he gave to men so that he allows men to create eternity but not to destroy themselves for eternity. And how does he do that? By taking the consequences of the evil deeds, externalizing them. You see, taking the damage out of the neshama and letting it be an independent entity unto itself. But since the Neshama, that person did do that evil, he was responsible for it, that evil, which now exists as an external damage, has the ability to inflict itself on that Neshama and cause it pain. But, as it causes the Neshama pain, a very strange thing happens. It disappears. As the damage, or the externalized damage, which, like, is like a Frankenstein on his back, causes the subject pain, but it does not destroy him, because it's been externalized. But as it causes him pain, it begins to evaporate. That is the secret of God's mercy. To externalize the evil, the consequence of the person, and allow that evil to work itself out of existence. That is the essence of his mercy. These are the two principles, existentialized or externalized. God can either allow your deeds to affect your existence, or He can make your deeds only affect your peace of mind, whether you're happy or sad, whether or not you're successful or, or not. But they will not affect your existence. They'll make you miserable, yes. But you'll be around to be miserable. <laughs> You see, you will not be annihilated. And as you live in that misery, which is a consequence of your own deeds, eventually the misery will simply evaporate, simply by its expression, and you will be free of it once and for all. Do we see that? Now, these are the two ways of working it. Either God can allow your evil deeds to destroy you as a subject, or He can externalize them and simply cause you pain and allow you to survive. Those are the options which God has, which, not He has, but those are the options which God has created. Okay? Let's take those two <laughs> options and see, in terms of what He has done in human history, how has He explored those options, or He used those options, with respect to the evolution of men from Adam down. Okay? Okay. <clears throat> Adam, the first man, he does a sin. What happened? Did he die? No. He didn't die. But yes. He did die. Did God save Adam Arishim? Did he externalize or did he existentialize? What did he do? Oh. The answer is both. <clears throat> In the case of Adam, he was both externalized and existentialized. But how? We see that he was externalized. We see that the evil of a sin was externalized because he went on to live. But so how was he existentialized? How did that... E how did the evil of Adam come back to destroy him? The answer is he was fragmented. Adam Rishon sinned. Was he destroyed? No. So obviously God took out the evil from him. But there was a part of that evil which remained in him and never left and destroyed him or part of him. It was existentialized. It was a statement on what kind of existence he will have. But how? 
How? Where did God do that? He did that because he fragmented the Nisham of other mission. Other mission was once one person with all the Nishamas put together with one mind, an incredible sense of self. Unbelievable. I mean, you can just begin to imagine. Imagine all the people that were ever created into one, wrapped up into one state of mind. Do you have an idea what that person is? That's like the sun. Now look at Adam after the sin. He was only a piece of what he was before. Adam died. His consciousness died forever. So he was extensionized. God allowed an aspect of the evil of the deed to permanently impair him. But what was impaired? What? His state of consciousness, the domain, the range of consciousness was diminished like that. But he was allowed to live as a consciousness. He kept on living as a person, but he was diminished, reduced incredibly to a fragment. So, the fact that Adam continued to survive was externalization. It was God taking the damage out of the neshama and simply punishing him. But the fact that God reduced the range of his self, sense of self-awareness and consciousness, and what he was aware of, that was permanent damage that God allowed to forever exist in Adam. So that never again would there ever be a man called Adam Arishan. Adam Arishan as that man no longer exists and will never exist again. That is a, a very powerful thing. After Adam, by Avon, please. After Avon, or rather by the Doha Flogger, what happened? What happened by the Doha Flogger? God looked at all the nations and he saw that there were 71 categories. You see. So he decided that the 71st category of Avon would have the ability to have most of Olam Haba, and the other 70 would only have minor aspects of Olam Haba, you see. But they all had relationships to Olam Haba, they all had some kind of structural relationship to Olam Haba. Well, when God did that, when God paid back the Dwarf Flogger, the generation of the Tower of Bovo, when he paid them back, did God externalize, did he existentialize, or both? And the answer is both. Why? God obviously externalized because the dwarf brother went on to live. The people went on to live, so they obviously were not annihilated. But they were existentialized. The damage they did was permanently a part of them. Why? Because what happened was is that even though each one remained a individual, but they no longer had the ability as people to create what they did in Olam Haba. So what does that mean? That means that God reduced the power of the Neshama, lowered the power of the Neshama, so that it no longer has the capacity of Kedusha or Holiness. It no longer has that power of creation. It didn't have the strength anymore. He reduced it forever. So they survived. The Dwarf Brother survived. But as Lilliputans, Lilliputians, they were small characters of what they were before. God shrunk the Nishamas so that it no longer had the power. And that was an existentialization. They lost. The Nishamas shrank. So they lost it. That's an existentialization. The evil that they did swallowed up what they were, in a sense. And it was gone. It was given to Avon. Transferred to Avon. <laughs> as far as these people were concerned, it was existentialized. Because they lost it permanently. <coughs> but of course there's a difference. Adam, the existentialization of Adam, his permanent damage was the loss of, of the range of consciousness that he once had. What is the nature of a mind that's the totality of all humanity? These people who are struggle did not lose the range of their consciousness. They simply lost the capacity or the power to create in Olam Haba. How did that manifest itself in consciousness? By the sensitivity to Ruchnius. You know how you can tell who has the big in the Shama? There's a way to tell. There are ways. One way to tell is 
the innate sensitivity of a person from small child to spiritual matters or desires of truth matters that relate to truth a child who insists on truth or on relating to something which is true you see automatically just at birth or just as a child as soon as it becomes recognizable as an individual we never taught that but there's something about that child we internally he values emits truth you see he values what's right and what's true. That is an indication of a high neshama. Where is he getting that from? It's built in. He was given that. Now, it's not that easy because there are many, many other variations. It's possible to distort that or flaw that psychologically and so on. I won't go into that. You have to be extremely capable to differentiate psychopathology from what's called neshama status. That's very, very difficult to build. It is possible, but it's very difficult to do. But, the point is, is that sensitivity to truth and sensitivity to spiritual matters is a barometer of the power of the Neshama. When Zidar Frogo was reduced in the Neshama, they no longer had the sensitivity or the desire for spiritual matters. They were much more mundane, much more physical. Well, to the level that they were, they were still incredible. I mean, you're talking about a generation at that time who knew the tricks of the trade to build a tower of Babel to try, try to totally revert cosmic forces. I mean, you, you, these were ordinary men, you see, in any sense of the term. But whatever it was, they were no longer sensitive to purely spiritual matters. <coughs> at birth, finally, Matutora, what happened? When Goyim became Goyim, sounds redundant, when people of the world at that time became Goyim, right, they lost the ability to construct an Olam Haba. Existentialization or externalization? Both, again. Because again, they were allowed to continue. They were incredible. They were allowed to continue as a subspecies of some sort, or as an altered species. As a species which never, in the outset, was intended by God. Because God never intended a man without the capacity to live eternally. But they were allowed to continue. They were. For the reasons that I have stated. But, the Neshamas were shrunk to such an extent that they lost all spiritual power to create an Olam Haba. They were existentialized. The evil that they did went into the Neshama, you see, and completely wiped out the capacity of the Neshamas to be sensitive to the spirituality that would be required for an Olam Haba. And that's what happens. That's why they have nothing to do with the Torah. Nothing. There are exceptions. Because, and we will get into this as we explore deeper, because there were nations, obviously there were many Goyim who became influenced by the Torah through Christianity and Islam. So obviously the matter is much more complicated. God does do certain things with the Goyim in certain ways. We will have to investigate that. But as far as we're concerned, for all practical purposes, this is what happened. You see. They were existentialized because then the Shamas were diminished for good, forever, to the extent that they could never own a piece of Olam Abba because they could never create it. They can reside in it. You see. Based on certain performance uh, criteria. But they can never own it. They can never create it. And that's a permanent reduction. That's a permanent impairment. And that's it. It's the end. And that is what we call existentialization. That's what happens when God says, let the evil that that man did become part of him. You see, that's what it means. When God says, let the evil become part of him, it means that the person is reduced in some capacity forever. Now you may say, well, so what? Because you don't realize what, what that person paid. Do you know the price that other wishes paid to go from before or after? Do you have any idea of how he felt after? He remembered to some extent what he was before. He had memory, he understood very well. He knew what he lost. Do you have any idea the depression that he had after? <laughs> to say that it was a clinical depression is an understatement. <laughs> Do 
And if there was ever a man who was more suicidal, or should have been suicidal, <laughs> was other mission after the hate. You know? But the point was, that's what existentialization means. Now, you may say, well, wait a minute, this sounds like a grim story. It's a grim story. Wait a minute. Can we existentialize in the other direction? What happens if we really are exemplary in good deeds? Can we grow in being? And the answer is yes. If you can be reduced, you can be expanded. You can. And that's how a person becomes a prophet. You think prophets are born? No. They're not born, they're made. You have to work to be a Navi. And the men who were born <coughs> weren't born to be him. Well, what is a prophet? A prophet is an individual with a certain type of neshama that is so existentialized in its power that it can contact or access the highest levels of existential planes and simply know what's going on simply by his access. You see, since the neshama is so great and it connects to these high worlds, he knows through his own mind what those, what is going on over there or the level of truth which exists in those planes. Now, how does he get that way? Because a prophet or an individual who is a tzaddik works on himself to such a degree. When he connected with spirituality in such a way that he began to build his neshama and he began to grow and grow and grow until one day it was so great he became a prophet. And he began to see things and know things which are not knowable and which are not seeable. So you can go the other way as well. You see, it is not a one-way street. <coughs> this essentially is the analysis of the principles or the mechanisms of justice and mercy as they apply uh, w- w- which the mechanisms of justice and mercy existentialization or externalization as they apply at least to some degree to the various phases of mankind to understand what it is that God does you see we notice interestingly that whenever God does something redeems the world he also externalizes we don't see it one isolated from the other which means that justice rings true, even in the presence of mercy. It is a combination of both, you see. And that the two seem to work together. And in certain phases, when it came to certain levels, stages of mankind, the demands of justice were enormous. Enormous. Let me tell you this one thing which I will only start and I will not finish. There are other ways that God existentialized, which are not knowable or not known, really. They are so subtle that you have no idea of how you've been manipulated at all. But there will come a time, you see, there will come a time when these subtleties, these subtleties of the diminishment or reduction, reduction of consciousness, which is the greatest form of externalization and existentialization, the greatest and most subtle way that God punishes in the w- is the way which is least known of all. It is so unknowable that the subject never knows that he's being reduced. See, it's only Adam that knew it, because Adam remembered before and after, really. But the subtlety of diminishment, of reduction, is such that you don't even know it. And what the Bonisham did was, when he applied the reduction of consciousness throughout time, is that it is so subtle, you don't even know that you're being reduced. You think that that's what you are. You think that that's the way you are and the way all men are. It is the subtlety of that kind of reduction, right, which hides, if you remember, what we call the GN ratio, the Guf Neshama change, where it was, we said that at the beginning of time, men were Shrashim, you see. We don't know that these men were Shrashim, they were roots. What is the root? What is the root person? What is that? A gardener? What is the root person? What kind of power is that? It's absurd to you. Because you are no longer in contact with that level of human being. And you should know that the people after that lost sight of what a root neshama was. And what a branch neshama was. Because the transition was so subtle, the reduction was so subtle, that it was literally not knowable. But there are other ways, there are other things that happen with other Mauritians, other things which happen, where mankind's consciousness was reduced also, 
but in ways which were totally unknowable to him and which affected his Bechiru, his free will. It remains ultimately for the Mashiach who arrives at the end to undo that reduction. And one of the most singular tasks, and I will say it now, one of the most singular and unique tasks of the Mashiach when he arrives, you see, especially the Indian of Mashiach Ben Yosef, is to undo the reduction of human consciousness and to expand it again to certain ways than what it was before. This is the greatest liberation and the greatest redemption possible. You think that the redemption of Israel comes when every Jew picks himself up and goes to Israel and builds the base on Mekish? You think that's what the ghoul is? That's not what the ghoul is at all. That's a, that is the outward manifestation of the ghoul. The external manifestation of the ghoul. The internal manifestation of the ghoul has nothing to do with moving from one country to another. It has to do with moving from being one kind of person to becoming another kind of person. That is true redemption, because that's real liberation. Someday you will all wake up, and you'll know exactly what I said. And you'll wake up and say, wait a minute. It was like I was sleeping. I was dreaming. It's like a dream. You ever notice in a dream when you wake up? You see? It's like a strange reality about it. It's like you knew it was a dream, but you didn't know it was a dream. It was like half and half. Or sometimes you ever notice something, sometimes you come to a realization where somehow you knew, you knew about that thing all the time, but yet somehow you couldn't put your finger on it or you didn't know about it. It's a type of insight which after it appears, you knew somehow that you were really aware of it. But until it appears in front of you, you never were aware of it. It's kind of that marginal stage. That is the expansion of consciousness which the ultimate redemption will bring. And everyone will wake up and say, wait a minute, of course, I knew that I was different, I was someone else, I knew it all along, yet for some reason I didn't know it, it's like I had a veil over my face, and there was something blocking me from seeing that which something instinctively and intuitively made me always feel, but it was so subtle, it was so subtle and so withheld from me that I couldn't put my fingers on it you see, until you actually see it openly. And that is the essence of redemption, the greatest redemption, is to remove the constant reduction on the consciousness of mankind. That is the internal redemption and is the one that we all really await. We shall see in the next time.